Um, Mackenzie Wark is an Australian born writer and scholar. Uh, she is known for her writings on media theory, critical theory, new media, and the situationist international. Her best known works are a hacker manifesto and gamer theory, but among many others, such as general, in, uh, general intellects, um, general intellects and, um, uh, capitalism is dead. Um, she is professor of media and cultural studies at the new school in New York city. Um, and with that, uh, let's turn it over to Mackenzie. We'll be back for some conversation afterwards. Hi there, and thank you for having me at Grey Area Festival. My name is Mackenzie Walk. Let me start by sharing some slides with you. All right, here we go. Um, all right, so uh, Worlding Protocol uh, is our theme, and I want to um, I'm going to address both the words in that title in a minute. Uh, I want to sort of frame it in terms of a, a project here of what would democratic collaborative knowledge work look like? How could we think about that as a project? And a project where uh, no forms of knowledge are considered sovereign over all the others. So uh, just imagine a utopian world where um, engineers don't think they have the answer to everything and humanities scholars don't think they have all the answers and artists don't think they're doing something completely different for everybody else and economists don't rule our lives and we have all forms of knowledge being able to work uh, in a collaborative, democratic, egalitarian way. What would that world look like? And maybe we have to create something like that knowledge practice uh, in order to avert the uh, worst possible consequences of the Anthropocene. And nothing I'd like to say about this is that the uh, gaps and incompatibilities between all these different ways of knowing might themselves be worth knowing. It's not like all of these different kinds of knowledge can, can sort of add up to something. That there's always sort of uh, inconsistencies and incompatibil incompatibilities between them. I do want to talk though about uh, the humanities as a, a set of knowledges. Uh, there might be interesting contributors of speculative, qualitative concepts derived from the study of the archives of various cultures and immersions in the present forms of various cultures. Hmm. Yeah, sorry. Bit of tea leaf from the, from the tea I just had. All right, so let me give some examples. Um, drawn from various uh, uh, humanity scholars that I know. And here I want to talk about protocol and worlding before we move on to some other things. Uh, Alexander Galloway wrote this actually, I think, really helpful use about a uh, useful book about protocol um, in 2003, I think nearly 20 years ago. Uh, and the key point to that is that the key concept is that protocol is control of decentralization. So let's not kid ourselves that a distributed uh, network is one that lacks control. Um, and protocol here you could think of as uh, ways of deciding at a border uh, what passes and what doesn't, but where there's an asymmetrical relation at that juncture, at that border as to what can pass and what can't. So maybe one of our questions is, can protocols be democratized and what might that look like? Um, maybe we don't want everything being able to pass every border all the time, but who decides and where and how? Seems like a set of key questions to ask about protocols. And let's uh, think a bit about worlding. And here I want to think about the work of uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro. Sorry, I can't pronounce that in Portuguese. And I'm drawing mostly on a a book with the wonderful and intentionally ironic title of Cannibal Metaphysics, uh, which is mostly about uh, Amerindian uh, myth, uh, myth or really worldview of philosophy from, uh, uh, from the Amazon. And here it's important to realize there are lots of very different worldviews and we can't really always uh, uh, see what other ones look like from our own. It's kind of why we need the sort of work of uh, ethnographers and others to show other worldviews to us. And uh, what's interesting to me about uh, uh, Viveros de Castro is the idea of rather than think about a multi-species world, and there's a lot of that now, there's a lot of work in uh, the humanities sort of, and the arts sort of moving outwards 
uh, from the human centered uh, towards what if we incorporated other species into how we think uh, about um, what it means to be. Uh, but uh, what's interesting about what uh, Vera Castro does with Amerindian worldviews is that they're actually multi-people worldviews. Uh, and that's the thing that, that strikes me as interesting about it because uh, Vera Castro is talking about worldviews uh, of Amerindian peoples uh, who happen to be human, who kind of propose that there are worldviews of other species, but where those other species think of themselves as people and us as not. So from the point of view of jaguars, jaguars are people and we humans are not. So it gets us to the incompatibility and irreconcilability of worldviews, I think. So when we think about worlding, who's worlding and are those worldings incompatible might be some questions that uh, work like this would help us ask. Uh, and then let me just gesture a little bit towards the work of Elizabeth Povanelli. Uh, we have the like life writing is sort of a big category. It's taught in universities now, but what's sort of non-life writing? Maybe uh, there's a little bit too much privileging of the living when we think about even extending uh, towards the uh, incorporating other species and how we think and act. Uh, so how do we incorporate rocks? How do we uh, incorporate the lithosphere? Uh, so geo geontologies is the title of this book, uh, playing ontologies, which is, you know, philosophies of being and geo meaning the earth. Uh, and uh, I want to just dwell on one particular story that Povanelli tells from uh, Anson Bay in the Northern Territory in Australia. And here is that place in one system of representation uh, as a kind of uh, nautical map, if you like. Um, but maybe there's others. And what interests me is uh, the figure of Chippel, which is a name uh, from a story that's also a name of a coastal tidal creek that's uh, in that, hidden away in that map. And let me just tell you a uh, triple story as told to Polvanelli by uh, 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 Ruby, uh, uh, who is, and, and this is my, my sort of redaction of um, Elizabeth's redaction of this traditional story. So here's the story. Chipple is a beautiful teenage girl who decides to dress as a young man, making hunting implements and men's clothes. She travels down the coast doing different things, including spearing a wallaby. And the crux of her story is an encounter with an older man. A bird tells her the man approaches, so she lies on her belly to hide her female nurse. Now, thinking Chipple a young man, the older man bids her to get up and cook the wallaby, and Chipple refuses, so he takes the wallaby and leaves. Another bird comes and tells that man, that the older man, that Chipple is female. He returns, they have a fight, and he wins the fight. So I love it because it's a, a transgender story about a creek, but transgender is an anachronistic modern Western term. Uh, and I love it because it's a story that um, narrates a uh, landform and is a way in which the humans of this particular area uh, are able to think about the rocks and the creek and the landforms themselves as in a sense people of that area that need a certain kind of care or they might sort of turn away uh, from the human people who are operating in that world. And it's interesting to me that it's a story that in, in modern Western terms is between genders. It's a place between, uh, used to be a place between different peoples who spoke slightly different languages. It's a place between regions. It's a creek that you have to cross uh, different uh, kind of ecologies, different places where you can find different kinds of food. And then also different genders is in there as well. Uh, so in, in what way could we learn from uh, traditional forms of storytelling and knowledge, how to connect to those kind of things, you know, sort of more abstract modern world, the kind that we live in. One thing I'll point out about uh, traditional uh, Australian knowledge, I don't know about in this example, but certainly in other parts of uh, Australia, there's forms of storytelling that predate the Holocene, but go back to the late Pleistocene era. So these, uh, this is knowledge continuously being produced and shared and passed on uh, with some degree of accuracy uh, through the entire geological epoch that um, sort of Western people like myself, our, our entire knowledge of the world is confined to the Holocene and his people with a prior knowledge. 
uh, that they've been able to pass on towards the Anthropocene. So maybe if one wants to learn about the change in ge how to live through the change in geological era, there are reasons traditional knowledges might be able to help us with that. But you know, it's not only their job to help us. Maybe it's their job to endure as best they can, and enduring us is then us being white Western settlers like myself. Maybe that's that's their business. Uh, and I want to just table another uh, uh, colleague in the humanities doing different kinds of work and the concept of the wake in Christina Sharp um, and the subtitle is on blackness and being and the wake here is wakefulness so being uh, alert to uh, the sort of political cultural and historical dimensions of one situation but wake also means mourning uh, and it means the ripple effect uh, left by the passage of a ship and the, the image is drawn from the passage of slave ships and then what is the ongoing uh, kind of residue and trace of that uh, through contemporary, uh, in this case, uh, American life, also black diasporic life elsewhere. Uh, and how do we pay attention to these stories that tend to get left out, uh, even of modern forms uh, of knowledge, archives and so forth. So I'm just giving some examples of people I think who are doing interesting work uh, in the humanities at the moment that's, you know, dealing with parts of, you know, the, uh, the elephant that, that we all in our, our variously disabled ways try to touch various parts of and produce a knowledge of. But what would be collaborative knowledge work in the Anthropocene in particular? Call it something else if you like, but we seem to have entered a geological era. Uh, that's no longer the Holocene. And one way I would explain that is that maybe what's happening is that geological time is moves, moving faster now than historical time. Uh, we seem to just relentlessly produce more and more of the same uh, technical, economic, commodified, exploitative world. Um, but geological time is changing way faster than that. Uh, the seasons seem, time seems out of joint, seasons happen at the wrong time, we have weather where it shouldn't be, California is on fire every summer, uh, as is my homeland of Australia. So what would be concepts adequate to this present situation? Uh, and some more importantly, ways of working that get us out of uh, um, habits of, you know, only sort of market-based or authoritarian-based uh, um, relations between different forms of knowledge production. So maybe one thing we need to do is, or could do, or could use, is ways of working with concepts. Uh, what do I mean by concept? Well, well, this is the simplest way I can explain it. A good fact is mostly true about something in particular. And a good concept is slightly true, but about a whole bunch of things. So how do we generate concepts that enable us to grab uh, the, the factual world by the handful and then be able to articulate different concepts together so that knowledge workers can kind of produce ways of uh, interacting with the world uh, and hopefully redeeming the possibility of a world uh, in the process. So that's, that's if you like, the big picture about practice. Uh, all right, so let me add, throw in some more uh, colleagues and friends and collaborators. Um, ben is also in this uh, festival. Uh, but I find this uh, concept of the stack really useful for thinking differently about the sort of technosphere that we're inhabiting. And here is the, a, a diagram of the stack as Ben proposes we think about it, where we uh, interact as users through our devices, uh, through a series of layers of uh, attack. It's a technical term expanded into a, a more general metaphor. So as user, we're dealing with an interface uh, that has a layer of addressability that's able to know where certain things are and connect them. Uh, we may or may not be working in some version of the city which gathers together the, the human people part of it, uh, but it's connecting uh, our physical addresses to addresses in a cloud. But at the end of the day, what it's doing is extracting resources out of the earth beyond any capacity of the earth to regenerate that. So that's that's basically the stack. Uh, I thought about it a little differently as uh, the thing vector. Uh, and it's to me the, the, the to sort of put a slightly different metaphor against that one. Um, maybe we see things a little bit differently. Uh, so the the if that's the stack, which particular 
possibilities of connection through it get articulated and why is is then uh, a slightly more uh, to press a little more critically on it uh, would be how I'd want to think about it. Uh, and then we can start thinking about who owns and controls those vectors, who designs the protocols, you know, for whom, so that we end up with uh, a kind of a, a technosphere of uh, the stack or vectors through it or protocols controlling the movement through it. Uh, that's kind of extracting more out of the earth than the earth can possibly sustain and the interests of whom. So billionaires can go to space. Great. That's really not a world that's going to last very much longer. So. Uh, here's a map of what that world might look like by uh, Martin Bargek. And it's interesting to me that the, the image of this map or the metaphor of this map is to think um, basically empires, basically to think uh, a sort of geopolitics of uh, these kind of like giant kinds of corporation that are maybe of something of a new type and might require sort of a new language to think them. So who does own and control uh, the protocols of the stack and uh, decide which vectors are possible through it. I'm going to call the ruling class of our time vectorless class. Owners and control controllers of vector. Vector, give it its simplest definition uh, in geometry is a line of fixed length but no fixed position. So term that means slightly different things in different sciences, but let's keep it that simple. So it's something that has uh, fixed quality, uh, techniques tend to have particular affordances, but the question of how it's deployed and for whom and why remains open and something that uh, we can ask critical questions about. So what does the plus class do? Control value chain through control of information. It's a little different to capitalism where you sort of have to own the, the factory uh, in order to exploit the labor that's in it. Uh, Vectorless class isn't that interested in owning the uh, physical means of material production, but of owning the uh, information uh, that controls those processes of production and consumption. So maybe that's a new kind of ruling class um, and, and requires a different language to think it. Uh, if there's a new ruling class, maybe there's a new kind of subordinate class alongside the others. There are still farmers in the world and still workers, but maybe there's also a hacker class, producers of information, producers of difference. So it's different to um, industrial labor where you, your job is designed so you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's not the kind of work. You have to actually produce difference that could be captured as intellectual property uh, in the interests of a class that owns and controls information that uh, those of us who merely toil in it don't get to own. So that's a sort of basic uh, diagram, if you like, of how I want to think uh, the larger historical uh, dimensions of the technosphere that we're all, all inside of. Uh, and I think it's worth having a, a, a map of power of conflict in that world. Um, because these are sort of the questions that were confronted. Yeah, it's like, how can we redesign the vector on the fly to do something other than extract surplus information out of populations, whether they be of rocks, other species, in Bavero de Castro's terms, other people, and, and human, out of human labor, out of the hacker class, and so on. So can the vector do something other than extend the wake of forgetting and violence? Uh, in Christine Sharp's terms specifically, of uh, the African diaspora, one can think of other ways that uh, the vector does violence uh, to um, the material and, and living and human dimensions of the world. And then the third question is, can historical time catch up to geological time and, and avert the worst uh, mass extinction? The good futures are mostly gone now. How do we avoid the worst of the bad futures? That would seem to be the, if one is future oriented, that would be the, the tasks for the present. And the answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows how to do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of skeptical of people who think they've got, you know, like all embracing answers to this completely unprecedented circumstances that we find ourselves in. So I, my wager is on speculative, collaborative, non-hierarchical knowledge and experimentation as a key component of thinking our way to the possibilities and futures we might sort of actually want. So uh, I've talked a little, talked mostly about work, but what about play? If we're talking about experimentation, maybe there's ways that uh, a more playful approach is going to yield uh, possibilities that work doesn't. Uh, now, I, I wrote a book called Gamer Theory about the way that 
uh, it's like the whole of life has been kind of gamified. We're all inside this sort of matrix of vectors and all encouraged to think of ourselves as, as all like players in and against it and against each other. Uh, so there's, there's a way in which play gets uh, turned into a sort of uh, commodified, information commodified universe, you know, where it's as if the playing field was level and, uh, and all that. It's sort of not really the case here. Yeah. Does anybody really believe that? Um, but maybe there have been kind of avant-garde of play that escaped that, that felt like play was the way to kind of imagine other cities for other lives, different forms of uh, organisation, ways of being human, uh, ways of being with things other than the human. Uh, so Game of Theory was, was my sort of more pessimistic book about the enclosure of the world and game space for the benefits of a vectorless class. Uh, this other book, Beach Beneath the Street, is about the sort of tradition of, uh, that we can sort of latch on to find in the archive of uh, ways of thinking playfully about the possibility of, of living differently. So uh, I wanted to finish up with some uh, work I've been doing more recently that connects to that. I've, I've done sort of historical work uh, on avant-garde movements. I love avant-gardes because they're sort of um, experimenting with the uh, media of their time and looking for, uh, you know, like avant-gardes are kind of like the antennae of the culture, uh, sort of trying to detect what could be possible and to bring out of the future something that could be possible in the, in the present to make that, that future real, to sort of physically manifest it. Uh, on the left here is uh, Michelle Bernstein, Aske Yorn, Unknown Woman, and, and Guy Debord uh, in the late 50s, um, plotting kind of um, uh, the revolutionization of art and everyday life and, and the whole world over, uh, <laughs> over cocktails and bottle of wine, which you notice has been spilt on the table. I, I, kind of, I love that. Uh, uh, why, why not have grand ambitions? And I paired it with a photograph of um, myself at um, Boston Nova Civic Club after I hosted my own uh, techno rave birthday party with some uh, trans uh, raver friends. Because uh, I've been trying to work on um, what can I learn from the play space that is uh, New York queer trans uh, raver techno nightlife. Uh, so maybe there's areas of experimentation in ways of, um, of being human and being together uh, in that universe. And maybe there's ways that that world uh, either is looking for ways to uh, inhabit a present uh, because there isn't a future or ways that other futures might be possible just in terms of how we interact with each other. So that's, that's the work I've been doing, and I'm going to share some, some slides and talk a little bit about that, that current work. Um, all right, so uh, I'm interested in mostly in kind of illegal warehouse frames, where you're sort of like descending into spaces that are sort of remade uh, for other purposes. And there's ways in which the old industrial spaces, particularly light industrial spaces of the city, sometimes yields these spaces that can be repurposed. And one can think about them, the repurposing. Um, retrofitting, if you like. We don't get to make uh, worlds entirely out of nothing. We're always having to like repurpose a world temporarily uh, to become something else, to create a situation that we might want to inhabit uh, for an evening where light, sound, the mix of people, uh, how people dress, all the chemistry is going to create the possibility of being together, something that humans seem not all that, humans of this kind seem not all, all that good at doing. So I became a kind of uh, ethnographer of, um, you know, sort of queer and uh, trans rave nightlife. Um, there's me probably with <laughs> making notes on my phone, taking a picture uh, at one of these, uh, these particular events. And we see people interacting. We see a little bit of uh, uh, deck that's running the audio. Uh, constructing like sonic spaces seems really key. Uh, here also to, to kind of uh, drowning out the uh, chatter of the human uh, and the sound of the city with even more sound and sort of like texturing it uh, is maybe one of the keys to creating kind of other possibilities. Uh, this is someone putting their uh, fingers over my phone because I'm 
too close to the center of the dance floor when I'm trying to take a picture. Uh, I was only trying to photograph the ambience. I was not trying to take photos of people, but still some of these parties are strictly no photo. Uh, you're really not supposed to document them. No selfies of you with the DJ behind you, no pictures of the people, no videos. Uh, and I think that's kind of an interesting principle uh, in a world of kind of overexposure uh, to kind of hive off something that's not, that, that's going to sort of refuse that, um, you know, use of the, the vector. Uh, it's, it's a paradoxical sort of relationship. There's a way in which you only find out about these parties by following certain um, Instagram accounts, some of which are private. Uh, so there's, there's a way social media sort of creates a space of possibility, but one that's then attempting to be a little bit remote from it, where one can experiment um, in the, you know, sort of relative intimacy of bodies with each other, uh, with, you know, sort of um, fog and light and so forth. Uh, so this, this creates a bit of a problem as a researcher. How am I supposed to research a world where I can't really document it? Um, because I think the consequences of thinking the no photo ban as a researcher is like, oh, I probably shouldn't name where this party is or who runs it or who was there, what happens there stays there. Uh, so how to do that? And I started to think about how we can think about ambiences, how we can get away from certain kinds of storytelling. Uh, and write about what the ambient creation of a situation collaboratively by groups of people looks like. And maybe that's a useful way of sort of decentering narratives of, you know, heroic individual stories with beginnings, middles and ends. Uh, what's a, a language and a photographic practice that's going to kind of evoke the middle, the, the, the in-betweenness uh, of people with each other, of various kinds of um, modern techniques and tools that we're bringing together so that we kind of imagine what it would, would be like to be human together, uh, at least in this temporary space and time, this little pocket of time that we can open up before the police arrive or before it all shuts down at 8 a.m. in the morning and we all stumble out <laughs> into, the, into the overly bright light <laughs> of the morning. So yeah, I've been trying to photograph the ambiences of, of spaces uh, and kind of think through what kinds of ambiences help generate what kinds of uh, interactions between people um, to get us away from this sort of situation, really, where there's like one person speaking to many. Uh, what's it like? You know, you still have a, a, a host and a promoter, the still a DJ. Uh, some people follow particular DJs and are fans of them, including myself. But how do you sort of move it back towards kind of collaborative production, uh, collaborative production of knowledge, um, but here knowledge of one's own body in relation to others uh, in the dark, in the flashing light, uh, with some chemical alteration of your perception and so forth. Uh, so are there ways one could learn from that? And with what goes wrong with it, I don't want to make out that uh, rave is a space of utopia because it's not. Uh, it's a space where bad things happen, where people get uh, sexually assaulted and harassed, where uh, people overdose, where people just behave like complete assholes, like as, as punishers uh, of others. But then what are the ways within the extended community of people who are queer and trans ravers in, on the New York scene? How are those uh, conflicts and behaviours mediated? Um, away from the dance floor, but also on it, would be a set of questions I think that are uh, useful for thinking through what you know, what kind of life is possible. What's at the limits of the human without imagining we have to all be perfect angels, but where our bad selves have ways of um, being uh, checked, accepted, checked, uh, and moved back into the possibility of being with others. So the ambience is uh, conducive, if you like, to states that take you out a little bit of, you know, kind of obsession with one's, uh, with oneself into a kind of dissociated states where you can sort of blend into the environment towards others, but not to encroach too much on their boundaries. Are there ways in which you can think of uh, ray practice then as sort of analogs for ways that we might uh, kind of interact uh, with each other outside of that space. So there's other ways that one can learn 
um, through the creation of situations where you take away certain conventions of sensory perception, of um, recognition of each other, such that, that a different way of being together might be possible. I don't want to say new, there's really nothing new about this. And uh, speaking of, of wakes, there's ways in which uh, I think it's very important to recognize that you know, kind of techno music, uh, nightlife in the United States owes a tremendous amount to African American culture. And, and those of us like myself who come to it from elsewhere have to recognize, I think, that we're guests in a uh, culture we didn't really create. We may have added some flavors to, but uh, it's, it's where recognizing that we're in the wake of an historical process uh, of people who only had the night and had to create this space to be away from the police, away from racism and so forth. Uh, this also, it, it applies in an analogous, not identical way to queer and trans people often, we don't have anywhere else. So we have to create these spaces where, uh, I don't say different rules apply, but different modes of interaction apply, uh, but where we get to be people uh, in worlds where, you know, if you, even as a white trans woman, there's worlds where I'm not, uh, I'm not people. Uh, I don't get to be human. <laughs> uh, I'm not recognized as belonging to that, to the human community. So we create spaces where we are, and then hopefully we can bring some of that back out into the rest of the world. So that's um, basically what I want to leave you with. I kind of started with ways of thinking about what the humanities might bring to collaborative practices of knowing together. I walk through some work that I think is kind of interesting that we can draw together here. Uh, I've sort of highlighted, you know, both the um, power dynamics of the present, which I think there's a new kind of ruling class. Uh, one really doesn't seem to have any uh, uh, ways of uh, surviving the Anthropocene. Uh, boys want to be on rockets going to space. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not really going to work for the rest of us. So um, are there ways we could work together collaboratively to produce different forms of knowledge? And are there ways of playing together that might produce different kinds of knowledge? Uh, and knowledge that you can make operative. And the example that I've given of that is sort of queer and trans new or nightlife. Not that it's anything special about that. It just happens to be the little world that uh, I, I inhabit at night when I'm not <laughs> teaching and doing these things during the day. So that's what I want to contribute to um, Grey Area Festival. And thank you for having me. I'll be back for question time. Hey, for everybody. Welcome back. We're live with Mackenzie Wark, who you just heard from. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And you led us through so many different um, ideas. And, you know, I, I just wanted, you know, the one idea that I'm the most familiar with and I've, I've studied before is Viveros de Castro and his concept of the ontological turn, um, you know, and this, this idea that we all are existing from our own subjective points of view, and those are shaped collectively, but are so different from every being to every other being. Um, and I was wondering if just to start us off, you could tell, you could tell us a little bit more about, about the, about this idea and how thinking, thinking through the world in this ontological way might help us to reach a different kind of worlding protocol. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I'm not an ethnographer. Uh, I, I'm only a reader of, uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro, you know, so I, so, uh, and, and I, I sort of think of my work as interstitial in that sense. I'm not an expert in these things, but is there a way of, of reading in between? So that's a little caveat. Uh, and, um, and his sort of key work is on, uh, Amerindian, uh, ontologies is, I guess, a word you could use. And it's sort of, I think, really helpful to imagine that there could be plural ones. Uh, like on, ontology meaning, you know, like what is being, what has being. Uh, there's a tendency to think that uh, would have to be a universal, um, but maybe it's not. And there's there's an interesting way that uh, Viveros de Castro reads uh, Amerindian uh, worldviews from sort of from the Amazon or thereabouts. Uh, as having this sort of per perspectival quality, where uh, you know, to the to the humans, the the jaguars are, are are not people because humans are people, but to the jaguars, <laughs> the humans are not people because jaguars are people. Like it's able to imagine this reversibility uh, of worlds, and I and I think that's oh wow, there's there's something sophisticated about uh, Amerindian philosophy that that. Uh, 
uh, the sort of German idealist tradition that St. Heritage doesn't have. So yeah, I found, found that incredibly useful and that would be sort of one of the, the tasks for collaborative knowledge uh, of enduring the Anthropocene is, is how to put those things on the same kind of plane formally so that we can kind of think about uh, uh, different ways of knowing and how different ways of knowing have come out of different practices of being in the world. Mm, totally. Um, and I think, you know, this, this idea of collaborative knowledge building, I think is really powerful and really important. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, of course, this is coming from Amerindian peoples and cultures that are much more ancient than our sort of contemporary ideas about knowledge or, or subjectivity. Um, and that's something that we've been trying to emphasize at this festival. You know, we can't, you know, so I think that, um, I forget who said this this weekend, but someone said, uh, I think it might've been, a. Uh, Oh, I'm going to forget, but they said that, you know, looking to the past is looking to the future. Um, and that's something that really resonated with me and has continued to resonate with me, um, you know, since then. And so, I mean, we're talking about the Anthropocene in this period of ge of like drastic geological change um, on top of drastic cultural and social change as well. Um, and so what, I mean, not to be too fanciful, but in, in, in your vision, what comes, what comes after the Anthropocene? Like what comes next? And, you know, yeah, I think that I, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, what can we do to alter the course that, that we're currently on? Yeah. I mean, first I'd, I'd sort of like to say that for me, I also see indigenous knowledge as contemporary rather than always being from the past. Like it's modern, it's as modern as we are. Uh, so, so to think of all of these different ways of, of inhabiting presence uh, and also different ways of, of operating with time. Uh, I don't think, like, let's start with no one really knows how to endure uh, a, a kind of rapid deterioration uh, of possibilities of worlds. It's very, very unevenly distributed. Uh, there are already climate uh, uh, migrants and refugees uh, the already places where uh, human habitation is almost possible. But like maybe there is something to learn from uh, uh, indigenous worlds in the sense that the experience of a world ending already happened uh, for a lot of indigenous people. So, oh, well, that's a, that's a thing that those of us who are from settler cultures could probably do to learn from at this juncture. Uh, Donna Haraway talks about can we, you know, make the Anthropocene as short as possible to get as quickly as possible to uh, things that are habitable uh, for as much of life as, as we can manage. I don't know who the we is in this, these phrases that I'm making, but I, I think that's sort of the task, the, the, um, the, the, the sort of the better futures are, are disappearing in the same way that certain species are, you know, kind of as we speak. Yeah. We've got a uh, got a question from the chat from the audience at large, um, talking about this from Eve, talking about knowledge production, work, and play, and how they intersect. Do you have any thoughts on how knowledge work has professionalized, and how people who aren't knowledge professionals can contribute their play slash work more effectively? Yeah, that's a good one, and I think there are ways in which um, the a certain kind of play and here I'm, I'm really just retelling uh, a book by uh, Johann Huizinger called Homo Ludens. There's this way in which maybe all knowledge and culture comes out of play would be Huizinger's, you know, sort of grand uh, meta narrative, but then sort of become sort of formalized into institutions, not necessarily a bad thing, but for Huizinger, maybe there's a way that the institutions become too constraining. And so then the game sort of simply become repetitive. Uh, and Brahoising is the origin of everything. Um, so why have we not amended the American Constitution in a very long time? There was a time when it seemed like the play of rewriting the rules was open, and then it stops. Uh, and we now have this whole school of legal thought about never modifying it at all, you know, like originalism. So for Hoising, a law comes out of play. Uh, and so does uh, philosophy, you know, like Hoisinger thinks about the contest between rival philosophers before the tyrant, you know, as, as, as the origin of how we got that. But, but at some point it became a very formalistic uh, sort of discourse about arguments that seemed a little disconnected from everyday life. So, yeah, maybe there's ways we need to sort of like um, 
very carefully open the the space between formal and rule-based knowledge and kinds of knowledge that isn't. Like we still need forms of error correction around what we think we know. Otherwise you end up with conspiracy theories and things like that. So, you know, uh, just because you looked up some random stuff on like Google doesn't mean you researched something. That's not really knowledge. Uh, so protocols of error correction are kind of important. But there may be different ways that those work and are interested in Australian Indigenous knowledge that seems to have been able to uh, sort of error correct and pass on knowledge back to the late Pleistocene. So we do have some knowledge that predates the Holocene that could be useful, given that we have an, another change in geological era to uh, epoch to survive. So yeah, it's it's a thing to be done uh, a little bit carefully, but but to, uh, kind of think that uh, any knowledge system, whether in a formal space or not, can have its own kind of rules of error correction uh, and to be open to that. The, um, you know, this, in, in thinking through these, you know, the, the Anthropocene and, um, you know, the, the disasters that, that face us, I, I, I was just reading Parag Khanna's recent book, Move, where he talks about mobility and global change and, um, you know, his, his vision for the future comes from, you know, his vision of the future is a nomadic one where people move to resources where they are based on availability and need. And, um, you know, the world isn't this kind of fixed place where you get this suburban house and you stay there and that's kind of your place, um, you know, and, you know, this and, and that, you know, thinking through like the contemporary, the contemporaneity of, um, of these, these ideas, which are largely, as you mentioned, are largely considered, I guess, ancient or, or older, um, you know, and just seeing the cycle kind of like continue to, to <laughs> continue to spin. I don't know. I was really, I, that, uh, that vision for the future kind of struck me and, uh, it was a, it was an interesting one for, for sure. Um, you know, and, and, and in another kind of vision of the future, you know, you at the beginning of your presentation, you brought up general intellects and the, your book and, you know, all of the different thinkers that are embedded in that book and how, you know, you kind of posit that it's not really possible to think through ideas anymore through one kind of singular, you know, figurehead. Um, we need this kind of more kaleidoscopic, more, more, more broad inclusion of multiple and potentially fragmented ideas. Um, and I was wondering if, uh, if you could talk a little bit about um, how you came to, to understand uh, thought this way and how, that, and how this changed from the singular, you know, iconic figurehead to this more expanded way of, I guess, collaborative knowing came about. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. My therapist has probably got some good answers as to <laughs> why I'm, I'm just, I really don't do well with certain kinds of authority. And, and I'm dependent as a scholar on people who have like spent their entire life reading Derrida, for example, like I'm, I rely on that and I, and I don't, I respect that, that one would choose a master thinker and, and operate in that space. Uh, I just kind of chose not to because I'm interested in what's sort of in between. But to sort of not do that thing of sort of like averaging or leveling or just like mushing things together, um, which is a bit of an American grad school syndrome, you know, where it's like I'm going to like mush in some Foucault and some Judith Butler and whoever, and, and it sort of doesn't really add up, you know. Um, it's like, wait a minute, you sort of like these things are choices in a way. You can't just mush it all together sometimes. So, yeah, I, I wrote two books. One's generally Lex and the other is Sensoria. Those are like collections of pieces where, and there's a little bit of a game-like part where I tried to get it to about four and a half thousand words only on each thinker and usually focused on one book and sometimes not quite their famous one uh, to, to kind of, all right, so how can we sort of get uh, uh, a, a little nest of concepts out of this person's work and sort of put it alongside somebody else but without sort of trying to mush them together so that the reader has got like different perspectives and they're mostly from humanities and social sciences that's, and the arts because that's worlds that I know, but they're still sort of like incompatible. And I think maybe that's a necessary uh, or at least useful skill in the 21st century is to be able to think a little perspectively that there's probably something true and right in some of these different perspectives, but not everything, and, and to be comfortable in the, that interstitial space in between. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it. You know, there nothing is ever one thing. You know, um, and I think that that's something that we've been talking a lot about over the over the course of the festival is how we can hold all of these different ideas and all of these different worldviews kind of at the same time. Because if we can't understand the complexity of the world and we reduce it to something else, we'll never be able to truly understand it. Um, and maybe we can't ever truly understand it anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, at least we can try to get, get closer. Um, we have another comment from the chat here. Um, Hannah asks, if Utopia is a project that has failed many times before, how might we understand various avant-garde guards or cultures that aim to create alternative presence and what relationship do they have to futurity? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, Utopia got caught up in a kind of Cold War discourse uh, or in the West, you know, like the Soviet Union failed because it was a utopian project, whereas like we in the West don't have one. That's not true. Like capitalism is also a utopian project. And there's also the sense of utopia as like some perfect ideal. Um, but it's not really the utopian literature is not really like that. Um, utopias are more practical than any other kind of literature. Uh, Charles Fourier, who, yes, really did think the seas would turn to lemonade, uh, was one of the few writers of his era who really asked who was going to deal with waste, who's going to deal with trash and shit. You know, like Fourier was really on that and tried to think that through, whereas the bourgeois novel that is contemporary with him, like no one ever even goes to the toilet, but alone think about what you would do with it, you know. So I think we need to sort of reframe utopia. Uh, and I and I think they all came true and they all worked up to a point, but they all just have some fatal flaw uh, as well, where, where they don't quite work perfectly in a way. Uh, so there's yeah, I think one has to sort of rethink what what utopia is in a way. And I've I've sort of used the uh, in in uh, molecular red. I'm sort of thinking actually, you know, utopia is sort of like a useful concept if you think of it as like maximum practicality, like the opposite of what we usually. Uh, sort of trained to think it as. Uh, and more recent work, I've sort of uh, shied away from that a little bit uh, and tended to think more about, it's not utopia because bad behavior is still going to happen. There's nothing we can do about humans. Um, but maybe there's ways of thinking about uh, situations that are more habitable, interesting than others. Um, but maybe they're temporary and maybe they don't scale. And maybe that's the best we can ever do. So there's, I think, a little... I'm in a little pessimistic mood at the moment uh, where, where I kind of think that's sort of, you know, like uh, you can actually pull off communism for about five hours for 300 people uh, with some good drugs and techno, uh, but then you have to go home to capitalism and be, have your labor be exploited or whatever, you know, but it was, but it was good for a morning. <laughs> uh, but how, how can that scale? I'm not sure. No one knows. You know, like no one knows how to make anything scale at the moment or endure. Yeah. Oh, that's really, you know, to, to endure, that's really interesting. I mean, it does feel like we're in this really disposable time. I mean, ideas are disposable, identities are disposable. Um, it goes way beyond like consuming a, a physical good. Um, you, you know, just not to switch focus too much, but, um, you, you will actually, first of all, um, I, in general intellects, I just want to shout out that uh, one of the thinkers that you focus on is Wendy Chun, who was also a speaker here at Great Area Festival and talked about her new book, Discriminating Data, which was awesome um, and kind of the structure of the world around us. Um, but you also mentioned another Great Area speaker, Ben Bratton, um, and his idea of the stack. Um, and I think that both of these you know, ways of analyzing the, the technological infrastructure around us are really useful. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, in, this is a question I've posed to a couple other folks, but I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, the opacity of technology seems to be a real barrier to understanding the whole context that we are, we exist in. And that's something that continues to, you know, confront us as a roadblock. And I'm wondering how, you know, in, in trying to think through this moment, um, and even think through past moments, and then from that extrapolate future ones, how do you grapple with the opacity of the stack, the, the incomprehensibility of it, the illegibility of it, and the exclusion of it as well. Um, and, you know, how can we think through, how can we approach it closer in order to perhaps build something more sustainable? 
I meant to put a, a slide in about Wendy's work because I, I knew uh, Ben was here and so I put a little bit in about that. So I, I, apologies to Wendy, I kind of, I, the slide fell out of the deck and then I didn't talk about it. Uh, and I've, I've learned so much from both of them, by the way. Uh, I'm huge fans of both Wendy Chan and, and Ben Bratton. Uh, yeah, like it's sort of like a little bit the, the very definition of a technology is, is a thing that hides what it does. Uh, so it's it's kind of like a, uh, a thing that will allow you to do something in particular, but you won't notice that you're not doing it, something else is. Like this would be one, you know, the, the very opacity could be the definition of what a technology is. Uh, and then there's a kind of um, uh, phenomenological panic that technology sets off where we sort of need to feel ourselves to be separate from the techniques. Uh, and to sort of demonize who's perceived to be closer or to be invaded or infected by it. It's never us. It's always somebody else is too technical, you know. Uh, so there's like, there's this sort of failure to think through. We're all, you know, like secondary products of, you know, many layers deep of, of techniques just so our bodies will function at all. You know, there, there's no non-technological human and probably never was, you know. Not an archaeologist, but I, I sort of get the impression the hand and the tool seem to evolve together. It's not like, we have hands, let's do something with it. You know, it's like, it's not really the history of, uh, of hominids, right? <laughs> uh, so we've sort of not really felt through that we're always inside it and always in a relationship to it. And then we're not encouraged to think about it too much because it's sort of in the interests of people who own and control technologies that we don't know too much about it. You know, like these things appear to us as sort of like closed devices that you're not even allowed to open anymore. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of hard and that's why I do media studies, you know, because I, I feel like media and technology studies are kind of uh, related and, and let's not have border wars around disciplines, but think those things together. It's like, yeah, how do you get people to think uh, critically in a good way uh, about the sort of embeddedness that technology is not just something you can blame as the, the bad thing because we're in it and it's in us. Uh, and it's nor is it helpful to like, you know, like finger the person who's too technical. And I'm now one of those people like trans women are like, your body is artificial, you're not biological. It's like, honey, nobody is. Everybody's propped up by meds and prosthetics and we're all disabled at some point in our lives. You know, it's like, yeah, you're not trans, but you, you're born with a cesarean, you know, <laughs> like you came into the world <laughs> through a technics, you know, like whether that, or you're a home birth, that's also a technics. That is also, right, there's a there's skill and art in, in how you get a human into the world, probably has been for a long time. So, yeah, that's sort of the challenge. Like, they're, they're like just even to begin, there's some, some little conceptual uh, shifts you have to make to be able to think. Uh, the Donna Haraway does this beautifully in Cyborg Manifesto from 1984 is the canonic version. It's still a great text for sort of thinking, yeah, like we're woven into it, it's woven into us. So let's move on to a different set of questions. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I learned a lot from French anthropologist Ludovic Coupai, who really talks a lot about this and how everything is a technology from the way we stand up to the way that we blink. You know, nothing is nothing is nothing is truly biological. It's all learned in one way or another. Um, and those those learned behaviors, those technologies of the body then become things that um, you know, are concretized through through social action and that kind of wrestle and kind of fit in with whatever biological like inherent facet might might be. Um, but I mean, you know, to, to draw some more from anthropology, which is, of course, my area of study and one thing that I'm really passionate about, um, I love your ethnographic approach to exploring these shared play spaces. And I thought that was such an in, that was such a that was such a cool thing. Um, I mean, you know, in thinking about phenomenology and how things feel to us, I think that in a lot of instances, um, you know, figuring out what the phenomenology of that shared space is and describing it and understanding it and presenting it and trying to capture it in small ways, while in some ways reductive, also I think is the the, the perfect first entry point into understanding um, because we, we understand everything through our bodies. And so I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that project and how it's been going so far and, you know, what you've kind of learned from, you know, adopting some of these these techniques in your in your research. 
Yeah, I, I think I was always an amateur ethnographer. Like uh, um, Hacker Manifesto came out of you know the kind of um, uh, avant-garde of of sort of media art, do-it-yourself, punk rock techniques, and so on of the '90s. You know, uh, and I just sort of hid the method a little bit because some people didn't in that world also didn't want to be too public or too visible. Uh, so I sort of wrote it as if that wasn't. You know, like the, the footnotes will, will tell you what worlds I was getting things from. Uh, and, and gamer theory also came out of just hanging out with um, the kind of people uh, who were like the avant-garde of, of game design, uh, you know, from around about 2000. Uh, when I stopped working on Hacker Manifesto, then I'm doing the game stuff. And then the early 2000s, there's this sort of little renaissance of game design going on. And I just like hung out with those people. Um, so, but yeah, it's like hackers, gamers, ravers. If, if I if I finished the fourth one would be hustlers, but that would be a whole other project and I need a different method. Because like those are the four um, <laughs> persona that, that strike me as interesting at the moment. Um, yeah, but I thought this time I'd highlight the method a little bit and the uh, writing I'm doing. A little bit of it's published in Noon Magazine, a little bit of the writing I've been doing on um, queer and trans rave culture in New York City uh, sort of puts me in the story a lot more. Uh, rather than sort of just writing the concepts, like I'm sort of more interested in, uh, here's a description of the situation, uh, here's uh, how I, what I'm recording of how other people perceive that, so it's not just my perspective, but I'm making that more, a little bit clearer. And here's the concepts, like how do concepts emerge out of particular practices is, is a thing that I'm sort of, I think that's an enduring theme in, in all of this work. So yeah, the writing's different. Um, and and more fun i kind of uh, i couldn't write after i transitioned i actually couldn't write like do real writing for three years and i feel like i'm back and I, but the method and the style of it has changed a little bit um and yeah and, I, and it's just sort of like oh like i always you know i wasn't as a scholar i was never an archive rat as a scholar like i can work in archives but i don't love that and it's not my main focus like i love learning from contemporary cultures and sitting at the feet of people who created things and then seeing who's, you know, the advanced guard of it now and that sort of thing. So I felt like I'd do that more explicitly. But then I'm in the double bind because I can't really, you know, like name some of the things that are interesting to me. You know, I can, I can obviously I'm going to quote certain people who have said public things about what's going on. Uh, but yeah, it's like, ah, oh, there's, there's a way in which, uh, like, I don't believe there's a Trump methodology, like, oh, let's a priori take all of the methods to be equal. Um, but to me, there's something, uh, there's a particular thing that the ethnographic has to contribute. And I'm, I'm, I'm a sort of amateur and, and late starter in that uh, as a method, but I, but I find it really helpful. Well, it's, I mean, it makes so much sense why I, I love all of your books then, because if, I mean, you can, you can kind of feel that and feel those, those, the way that you've gone about that research, even if it's not presented exactly in that way. And I think that the, I think it comes through really, really strongly. Um, you know, I, we're just about out of time, which I'm really bummed about because I have a million things that I want to, I want to ask you about. Um, but, uh, I am. I'm. I mean, it's really exciting that you're working on this project with the rave scene. I mean, what a fun research project, you know. Especially when you're applying for grant money, you know. Um, <laughs> gonna... oh, I never apply for grant money. What? I never apply for grant money. Oh, I mean, just in general, you know. Hey, oh, I got to go to the office, and it's you know, <laughs> Boston Nova Social Club. <laughs> uh, yeah. Awesome. yeah but I, I. I don't. I don't. I don't spend any time raising money for this stuff. I just go do it. Um, yeah. And I, it's so freeing. <laughs> it's that's not for awesome. everybody. That's my word. Oh, yeah. I should take a page out of your book. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> well, Mackenzie, thank you so, so much for being here with us today. Um, I know you're just coming back for some travel and must be kind of jet lagged and tired. So we really appreciate your time on, on this evening. Um, everybody, you can go and uh, we're going to drop some links into the chat where you can find all of Mackenzie's books. I encourage everyone to. Then, yeah, them. the new book on Verso is. I believe it's it's, it's capital is dead. Is that capitalism is dead, or is there a newer capital is dead? There's uh, a book on Kathy Acker called Philosophy for Spiders from the Duke, right the Kathy Acker Acker book, of course. That's a new one. That's one I haven't gotten my hands on yet, so yeah. I'm excited yeah. to check that's that out. That's what I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Wade. Thank you, Barry. My thanks. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really perfect way to close us up. So, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.